So, wonderful. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us for day four of our TSL Partner Power Protecting Biodiversity Summit. We're delighted to be here today uh, understanding how we measure biodiversity. And I've got four, three amazing scientists who are going to be helping us to explore that. Uh, we have our panellists with us today. We have Sahid Opiemi Adebisi, who is a faculty member at Osun State University, Nigeria, and he's a specialist in plant biodiversity and particularly plant genetics. We have Dr. Rosetta Blackman, who is an eDNA and, and aquatic systems biodiversity specialist from Atomat Lab at the University of Zurich in Switzerland. And we have Dr. Prasanta Chakrabarti, who is a professor in the Department of Biological Sciences and curator of fishes at the Museum of Natural Sciences at Louisiana State University. So I'm gonna hand over to them shortly to do an introduction to themselves and their links with biodiversity. And then we're gonna have a bit of a conversation about how we can help to measure it. So welcome everybody, thank you for joining us. And I will uh, like to start with Rosetta if I can. Would you like to? Introduce yourself to us, Rosetta. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much for having me today. It's a great, um, it's great to be here. So uh, my name is Rosetta Blackman. Um, as uh, Kirsty said, I'm uh, based in Zurich at the moment in Switzerland. But from the accent, you could probably tell I'm, I'm from the UK originally. So um, my research, right? So why am I interested in biodiversity? Well. Um, I'm kind of fascinated by rivers, really. Um, normally you'll find me in one, kind of looking under a rock to find out what's living there or looking at some plants to see what's growing. Right now, the river's down near me um, in the summertime. There's lots of lovely plants to look at, so I'm, I'm frequently in and out of them. Um, I guess I started mainly working um, in the UK as an ecologist under kind of identifying pressures and looking at uh, human impacts on rivers by looking at uh, insects or, or fish or plants and, and seeing what different pressures were, we were placing on them. So be it organic pollution or, or extra sediments going into the water body. So that's, that's where I mainly kind of started as an aquatic ecologist. But since then, I've kind of taken a kind of change of pace and I now look at kind of um, biodiversity from a molecular point of view. So I use environmental DNA and, and today I'll, I'll hopefully show you a little bit about um, what environmental DNA or eDNA is. But I did a PhD looking at how we can uh, detect invasive species and how we can kind of uh, use environmental DNA for early detection. And now I look at how we can use eDNA to monitor whole river networks and look at all the biodiversity together. So trying to find those hot spots that we can conserve and trying to protect species that we might not be able to record with by other means. So that's what I really do to do at the moment. And um, I find it fascinating and I hope, hope you guys will as well. So that's, that's me. Thank you, Kirsty. Great. Thank you, Rosetta. Looking forward to finding out more about environmental DNA and what that is later on. And uh, Saheed, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your research? Yes, uh, thank you. Yeah, my name is Sahid and I am a research scientist. I am uh, from Nigeria and um, of course, this very journey of uh, biodiversity uh, investigation has took me to a uh, few countries of the world like Germany, like uh, Sweden, like uh, UK, uh, US, New, uh, New York specifically. And of, of course, what inspired this very research was actually the, the concern for nature and the environment. And luckily, uh, when the uh, global concerns started uh, raising awareness about the uh, SDGs, MDGs, and also looking about the sustainability, yeah, so then this is a very uh, wonderful niche for me to uh, explore and also uh, dig in, into my research and also how this can benefit the local communities, the global communities, and also impact or maybe contribute to humanity. These are the questions and these are the things that are on, on my mind when I started uh, thinking about this uh, biodiversity of a thing. And I discovered that uh, in, in order to be relevant, there is need to look at what is the, what is the trend of events in technology. Then I looked at, yeah, DNA technology, uh, biotechnology, and also uh, molecular biology. And I try to uh, figure it within what I can do within the plant science. And that is uh, the journey so far. And it has been very fantastic because um, looking at the plant biodiversity, there are a lot to learn. There are a lot to learn identification, uh, speciation, conservation, a lot of things. So thank you so much. I think uh, during my presentation, there will be more to also talk about. 
Great, thank you very much, Shahid. Um, Prasanta, over to you. Sure, well, thanks for putting this panel together. I'm excited to be here with Rosetta and Saeed. Um, so for my angle about how I measure biodiversity, I'm a, a fish systematist. So I'm looking at the tree of life and trying to better understand how that can tell us about evolution and earth history. And I've been lucky enough to have traveled to, to almost 40 countries looking for new species. So I've uh, described 15 new species and also documented extinctions as well. And so, you know, there's easy ways to document new species. You can measure the distances between parts of the body to compare them with other species. You can see, you know, how many rows of teeth they have, things like that, if that doesn't fit with you know, uh, a, a particular known species, it may be a new species. We also use genomics, uh, genetic data, and CT scanning and MRI, but it can be very low tech and it can be very high tech. We describe fossils, we describe living species, uh, and we notice when things aren't where they used to be. So uh, I hope everybody here uh, who's listening has used something like iNaturalist or other programs that can be used to, to measure and document what species are where. Uh, but for me as a taxonomist and, and um, natural historian, I like to go to new places where people haven't been and collect and observe species and compare them in a museum setting. So I'm a museum curator, so I have rows and rows of jars of fishes and that is the uh, placeholder, the documentation of which species exist now. And you know, if you compare that with specimens at the Smithsonian or the Canadian Museum of Nature, which I'm where I'm working right now in, in Ottawa, um, that that documentation, the the voucher specimens help us compare uh, what species exist, what species we may have missed in the past in terms of documenting, documenting them for taxonomy. So that's my angle for, for measuring biodiversity. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Prasanta. Okay, so I'm going to uh, start our sort of panel discussion section now by handing over to Sahid. So Sahid, you talk about plant genetic biodiversity and the students in their essays this year and throughout our debates and discussion have identified lots of different levels of biodiversity from considering everything on the planet right down to genetic biodiversity. But what is genetic biodiversity and why is it important and how do you measure it? Yeah, thank you so much. I think uh, uh, maybe I can have my slide so that I can run through the, that information so that it, it will bring life to you. Yeah, thank you so much, yeah. I will quickly speak with this slide so that uh, we can have the life about the discussion. Yeah, DNA techniques for measuring biodiversity and for conservation strategies. Yeah, next slide. Next slide. Yeah, I think we can move on. Yeah, thank you. So the the outline is just to, to just picture biodiversity, then what are the problems and the challenges, and also talk about the biotech, which is the solution also. And um, for the very reference to just say that what are the significance of biodiversity, it just it means of the yeah, making ecosystem more resilient and society stable. And plus, we have noticed the destruction over the years, which uh, uh, Johan Rockstone uh, has been uh, always talk about, yeah. Yeah, these very challenges can be air pollution and uh, climate change. I think there are a lot of advocate environmentalists that have been talking about these issues. Of course, our ecosystem from water to air to soil, they are unsustainable at the moment. Yeah, the bigger picture, the bigger, uh, the bigger picture of this is what the, the, the NASA data is showing us as at 1970 and what we are now in, in the 2020, from this very picture, you can see a lot of is happening in the world that is making the, the biodiversity not, uh, uh, not feeling fine. Yes, next. Next. Yeah, I think uh, one of the major concerns that has led us to this place is actually the population. The population aspect of the world is a major issue. And when we come to the solution that we, that uh, the question is actually addressing, it is about the bioresources. 
what are the bio resources available and uh, how 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 many of them are threatened and how many of them are actually lost those are the questions that uh, the biodiversity is uh, is of major focus and yes when it comes to genetic solution what we want to look at is that uh, which one are available among these very species and which one are not available and what are the variations in those ones that are available and why do we need to even know them it is because adaptation is very important variation is very important conservation is very important and of course what are the methods that uh, we are using in doing this to measure the biodiversity using the dna technology and some other um, uh, molecular biological uh, systems dna extraction uh, amplification and purification That very methodology is very relevant in this very discussion. And when we have the overview, yeah, when, you, when we have the overview in the lab, we can have a kind of a sequence from the sample collection. From the sample collection, we can go on to uh, the lab work. And of course, the major aspect of it is the Sanja uh, sequencing, which is a technology uh, that is first discovered to actually be into this very DNA knowledge about uh, about about the DNA, yeah. I think, uh, yeah. At the at the head of the whole research, we will come out with this very output. I think we can reserve this uh, this uh, this very slide to to actually picture what how is how relevant is the DNA to the biodiversity. If you look at this very two species of the butterfly. We can think from the ordinary sense of view that uh, maybe they, they are the same thing, but actually a similarity among them, but DNA technology will actually give us the true picture of what happened to them. And in, in the other sense of it, there is a plant that I actually work with, which is a piper in, in the world of my recent researches. If you look at the pictures of this very plant, they are almost the same thing from different countries, from different ecosystems. But of course, there are differences between them which are difficult to know from physical uh, outlook. But the DNA technology is actually uh, helping in identifying, differentiating, and also try to know the population status of which one is not available and which one is available. I think these are uh, the common knowledge that I can quickly share in regard to uh, what DNA technology or is relevant to biodiversity from Casti. So thank you, Casti. Mm -hmm. That is my quick response. Great, thank you, Sahid, very much for that. And Rosetta, you also work with DNA, but a different kind. What is environmental DNA and how does it help you to measure biodiversity? That's a very good question. Um, yes, um, so hopefully, um, uh, yeah, I can explain what eDNA is and I can um, show you a quick video of it. So hopefully um, we can play that video now. Okay, so um, environmental DNA, what is it? So what I'm trying to do here, and this is me in a river just down the road uh, last night. So I'm trying to go and collect some DNA shed by organisms into the water. And how do I do this? Well, first of all, I need to put on some uh, some clean gloves to make sure I'm not going to be capturing any of my own DNA in my sample. So that's the main thing. We want the biodiversity in the river, not me. So I put on my clean gloves and then I need um, some sterile equipment. So nothing um, is contaminated with any other system. So I have a, a clean syringe there and then a clean um, Sterivex filter, a, a filter unit, which is what we'll use to collect the DNA. So as simple as those, that's all I need. And I get into the water body here. Um, I wanna enter the water body and sample upstream. So I'm not again, contaminating my uh, water with anything I might have bought in. Um, and then I just, um, simple as that, I draw up the water using my um, syringe to an approximate 50 mil at a time. And then my filter unit can then uh, be screwed onto that syringe. And so it fits together nicely. And then as, Easy as that, I then push the water through my filter unit. So what I'm doing here is the DNA from that water 
is then uh, sticking to that filter paper within that filter unit. And then the clean water is then coming out the end of that filter unit. So I have my eDNA sample. Um, and I think there's a, a closer up view. So you can see the little uh, unit on the end. That's where my eDNA is um, uh, being held on that filter paper. And that's what, that's what I'll extract the DNA from once I get it back to the lab. So it's as simple as that, really. I then uh, need to prevent any further contamination that might happen to that sample. So I'll, I'll put on some uh, red caps. Um, you'll see that now. And I'll label the sample um, to make sure I know where it's from and who took it and, and, um, and when it was taken. So there's some downstream um, processes where I take this sample back to the lab and um, I uh, extract the DNA using um, some chemicals and some, um, some shaking to, to release that DNA um, and to clean it. And then essentially I have a, a tube of, um, of DNA from that water body. And with that, we can then assess it for lots of different things that might have shed their DNA into that water body. So it's, it's a really exciting sample method. And I think this very short video, uh, it's obviously not the full story, but it shows you how quickly you can um, go out and collect a sample. And uh, with that, it means that our biodiversity monitoring can be kind of um, increased like lots so now at the moment we uh, tend to use uh, methods that are quite time consuming or costly require a lot of skills to go out and take all these samples whereas eDNA can be a citizen science project it can be done by anyone to collect these samples and then experts in the lab will extract that, extract that, that DNA but probably the the most exciting part about having an eDNA sample is once you've done all the downstream lab work and you have your tiny, tiny Eppendorf tube of clear liquid or DNA, um, we can then assess it for lots of different things. And when we're thinking about biodiversity monitoring, previously we were always looking at things in isolation, perhaps uh, fish or, or plants or, or, or insects. But now we can use DNA shed by pretty much anything that's in that, that river, we can, we can try and look for it. So we can look for bacteria, we can look for changes in the bacteria communities in rivers, and, and we can also look for the fish in that same river. Um, but also we can look for the mammals that maybe drank from that river. So um, rare mammals we might, might be able to pick up. And um, it's a kind of a unique game changer in how we might be monitoring um, our river systems, our aquatic systems, our terrestrial systems also. Um, and in some cases, people also take uh, footprint samples from snow and get the eDNA from that as well. It's a, it's a really exciting new um, monitoring method and um, hopefully it will lead to a, a lot of new findings about our biodiversity and where they are, particularly hotspots for uh, rare species and, and things that we might not see because they're so rare, but we'll be able to collect their DNA. So yeah, it's a, it's a really cool, exciting, exciting future for biodiversity monitoring. Fantastic, thanks Rosetta, it sounds fascinating. And I imagine it's, it's if you're thinking about something like a tiger or, you know, that's yeah. very difficult to spot in a real, you know, dense jungle habitat and there's not many of them left. We know they're endangered species, something like EDNA would be a really useful tool for that. Definitely. I think these envi well, environments that maybe we can't um, survey as easily as, as a river in Switzerland or, or you know, these, these difficult, hard to reach places, they're definitely EDNA can be a, a real plus, a bonus there. And um, hopefully it will lead to, to better understanding of where we have uh, rare species like how how rare are they you know and, and and understanding systems better it's um yeah it's really it's really good I really Great. enjoy it and when you're talking about capturing that genetic information what is it that the animals or the plants are leaving in the water or in the samples that you're able to detect so basically it's like uh, I always when I talk to people it's like having if you have a bath right if you get into a bath you you shed your skin cells you shed uh, sweat cells or anything like that you essentially it's not very nice I know but like think of that in terms of a river okay a fish fish tend to be pretty slimy so um, a fish will shed, shed lots of slime and other things will shed mucus and you have um, uh, different things being shed into the system but essentially that's what we're doing we're, we're picking up any kind of evidence of these sloth um, scales or um, skin cells or anything like that from the from the um, species so that's that's what we're collecting Sounds gross, but obviously really important information. <laughs> yes, to be I know. <laughs> yeah, the glamorous life of a scientist. Oh yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So we've spoken a little bit about rare species, but obviously scientists are still discovering new species on a fairly regular basis. 
Um, so Prasanta, I wonder, how do you go about identifying and describing new species to science? Sure. Um, well, you know, a good first step is what Rosetta is doing, you know, is sampling the environment for seeing what possibly is out there. And then if there's some uh, sequences that don't match up with uh, a known group. So, you know, if you combine what Rosetta and Saeed are doing. So if Saeed's, you get the DNA from the environment with Rosetta and then Saeed's putting it in a tree, a phylogenetic tree, a tree of life. And then you're saying, oh, okay. So these things, something here doesn't have a name that fits with what our genetic database says. That's a good first step. And that's usually the first step I take because rarely do you walk up to a, you know, a cave or a stream uh, and say, you found something and like, oh my God, this is definitely new. That has happened to me. And that's like euphoria, right? When you've like, there is no black cave fish. This is a black cave fish. Oh my goodness, this is a new species. That does happen when you're in the field, but you have to know what's out there first. And so putting it in a genetic tree is a great, first uh, pass. And then what you have to do is compare the actual individual. So as Saeed said, you know, you can use the DNA to, to re-identify what's in a museum collection. And it's often in, in museums where these specimens are housed. And then you go in and, and you measure and compare the morphological features. So features, like I mentioned again, about, you know, different distances and, and meristics, the counts or um, genetic samples to show, you know, there's this much sequence difference between the known species and what's potentially unknown. And then you fit it back in the tree of life with a name. So you give it a, a scientific name, a Latin name, uh, a new genus and species, or just a new species name to see how it fits. And that's a, an old discipline, you know, it's a, going on 200 plus years of, of naming species in the scientific way but uh, there are also local names that you try to incorporate and indigenous names that may exist. So you may also learn from, from the local people what species are there, and, and then you try to put it in a scientific context. So that's the sort of the brass tacks of, of naming new species. Okay, and it's really interesting that you mentioned uh, working with local and indigenous knowledge there. Do you think there's a good connection between modern Western science and local and traditional knowledge of habitats and the, the biodiversity there? I think it's it's a connection that's uh, increasingly uh, the importance is is being understood. It's something that um, I've been lucky enough to to have understood um, from my career, just going to these places and and having boots on the ground. And you know, in, in Sri Lanka, I, I, the local fishermen had more names for the species than I did with a scientific context. And it actually made me think, oh, they're right. They're, this one is skinny. They had a, um, a local name for skinny uh, for one of the species. I'm like, oh, this is one of these that I didn't notice this had this feature. And we went back and did the molecular work and we did the comparisons in the labs. And I named it, uh, it was actually a new genus. I named it Carla after the name that the locals gave it. So yeah, incorporating the local knowledge, they often, because they're there, understand of course, their species better than we do. And, and you know, in the past, Western scientists used to float in and do their own thing and not talk to the locals. And you're missing so much information by doing that. So. Yeah, working with locals and indigenous communities can really help our science. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a, a bridge that's being um, uh, built still, but people are doing better, a better job at that. Great, thank you. And we've spoken a lot about animals diversity. And I think many people, when you're considering biodiversity, think about the plant side of it and how important that is. So Sahid, you, you specialized in plants. Why did you choose to think about plant genetics and biodiversity rather than animals? Wow, well, like uh, one, of, one of those beautiful uh, topics that say that, uh, uh, would there be life without plants? Uh, and uh, you, you also agree like, majorly the basic food that's available to a human being are plants. And hardly will you see them, vast majority are vegetarians and the people that depend on plants play a lot of roles in, 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 uh, in, uh, in nature because when uh, uh, 
We look at the energy level, we look at the food level, we look at economy level, we look at even the recycling of nature itself, the balancing, the, the um, nutrient recycling and even the gaseous uh, availability and all of every, every, every lifestyle. And, of, uh, and uh, uh, among those things that actually attracted me to plants is that a plant is uh, somewhat simple to relate with and uh, it has a complexity that are interesting to study. Like physiology, the morphology, and species are of variety. And one important thing that makes the genetics uh, study of plants more unique is that uh, uh, you will be seeing physically that maybe they are of the same thing, but at genetic level, you realize that they, there are a lot of differences in their mechanism, in their system, in their orientation, in their exomatic. Uh, 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 reactions. These are beautiful things about uh, what uh, the plant is embedded in when it comes to biodiversity. And finally, I think a uh, 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 plant has also been uh, uh, a kind of a species that are, are coding this very uh, nature when it comes to uh, the issue of relevance of the, uh, the ecosystem sustainability, the climate change, and also a lot of things, survival and even the health issues. So I think plants is, is very, very relevant here. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. So perhaps almost more important than some of the animals for the ecosystem services they provide and being the base of the food chain and base of habitats for all life, really. So perhaps not as sexy as elephants or whales, exactly. but, you know, more perhaps eco uh, environmentally important for us. So great to know that there's research going on into those. Fantastic. Thank you, Sahid. Um, so Rosetta, I'm going to come back to you now. I wonder how does understanding biodiversity better um, Give us, can that give us any impact or understanding of the health of the ecosystem or the, the river or the environment you're looking at? Yeah, definitely. Um, so uh, I'm, I, when I first got into ecology or, or monitoring biodiversity, it was very much on the um, kind of looking at uh, pressures, how we can uh, conserve river systems by understanding what lives there. So um, I looked mainly at uh, algae and insects and, and plants and I'd um, kind of uh, monitor what, what, what we found in a river and then be able to use that information to find out what kind of pressure that system was under. So if you think about anyone, right, we all have our, our kind of favourite place, our niche of where we want to want to be, be it in a nice warm bed or anywhere else like that. So same thing happens for insects or, or, um, or um, uh, plants. They have their, their requirements, their needs. Um, they might like uh, really clean water or can tolerate certain pollutions or certain nutrient levels. So when we uh, collect our data for insects particularly, um, be it with uh, a kick net sample or environmental DNA, we can then uh, kind of use the information on the species we find um, uh, to find out kind of what, what type of water quality these, uh, these insects are, are living in. So we can have um, very, uh, stone flies really like very clean water. And so we can say um, that's a good, good water quality or good ecological status. So we can use that kind of broad sense of a, a description there. Or we can find um, samples we might take, might not have very much life in it at all, but it might have certain fly larvae or, or, or chronomids or, or um, mosquito larvae or things like that, that, that might be able to tolerate certain other types of water quality or organic pollution. And we can, we can do the same with plants as well. So um, aquatic plants that uh, love nutrients, we might know that um, there's a lot of nutrients getting into our water body, which might be from um, surrounding land use or, or pollutions or, or anything like that. So we can, we can use these, uh, these uh, different groups uh, as biological indicators um, to see whether um, there are any pro problems in the rivers. And, by doing that um, in kind of a systematic way, we can and then hopefully hopefully improve the water quality or to stop those pressures having an impact on on the biodiversity itself. So that's that's really how I originally got into um, aquatic ecology and biodiversity monitoring. So it's really useful and it comes from uh, 
years and years of, of research of knowing where these species love to be and, and what their requirements are. So it's, uh, it's still very useful and uh, yeah, very important for our monitoring systems. Great, thank you. Um, Prasanta, coming back to you, um, how does the evolutionary biologist estimate the number of species that you might find in a habitat or ecosystem? Because obviously you can see a certain amount, but if you're thinking about all the tiny microscopic things and everything else that you can't see, how do you put a number on it? I love that question because it is it is hard. You know, we want to uh, understand species as sort of the, the measure of biodiversity. How many species are there on earth? And we're far from even really getting a, a, a complete consensus on what a species is. So, you know, Rosetta mentioned the stoneflies and I, I just saw a stonefly the, yesterday for, you know, a pretty big one. And we we're like, oh, what, what is this species? You know, and, and finding out exactly what species are and where they are is, is probably one of the hardest questions in this biodiversity paradigm. So most of the species that have existed on earth if you're talking about evolutionary context, have gone extinct, right? 99% of them in the three and a half billion years of, of Earth history, of life history on Earth. Um, and so we're still measuring extinction at the same time as, as what species um, uh, are, are on Earth today. And so it's not the same thing as species of mammal and the species of bacteria where there's different forces of speciation going on. So it, it is a difficult question. There's about a million species described um, and 350,000 of the species that have been described are beetles. That's more than all the plants. So we need more taxonomists working on plants like Said, and we need more taxonomists and, and natural historians going out and boots on the ground to places where species are undocumented. I see there's a question in the chat where the most recent estimates of total number of species on earth, it's about 8 million um, is, is sort of the uh, low estimate if you're not counting uh, how much potential bacterial uh, uh, um, protist life there is, there is lots of undocumented microbial life still. So that could be tenfold more, 80 million, um, but 8 million is the number that I've seen most recently of, of the number of undiscovered species on earth. Wow, that's a huge number. So this is a question to all of you really. How do you think technology has changed how we measure biodiversity over the years? Obviously we've made hundreds of leaps in technology over the last hundred years. So what were the very early stages, you know, before we had all this amazing computer technology and genetic analysis, what did people do to measure biodiversity to start and how far have we come? Anyone want to have a go at that one? I can start with that one. So, you know, at first we were doing just like preservation, like how did Linnaeus and Darwin keep, you know, document, because you can always illustrate something, but then if you had to go back and, and, and uh, actually document it, you know, keeping um, plants in herbarium and, you know, pressing them, that was a pretty modern technique 200 years ago. And now we can do eDNA for, uh, obviously, as Rosetta was talking about, but also genomic sampling, which, you know, you can look at the entirety of the DNA of an organism, which is just this incredible field. And it sometimes moves too far ahead before uh, the traditional uh, science can catch up. So there's lots of genomic work being done, but there's no specimen in a museum that's tied to it. So Saeed talked about, you know, correcting the identification of of, me, of um, something based on its genetics, we can't do that if we don't have a specimen in an herbarium or museum. So we need that connection between sort of traditional and, and uh, traditional taxonomy and genomic work. And, you know, some of us like me tried to do both at the same time, maybe not always successfully, but yeah, that connection needs to be uh, between old research or, or traditional research and, and modern tools needs to be, uh, um, strengthened. I'd reiterate that strongly like all the data that we derive from eDNA all um, comes back to having a, a reference a sequence that we can identify that, that, that DNA sequence to and essentially we want um, the information derived from taxonomists and, and the subsequent referencing and sequencing of a, of a sample to be able to have that. 
So I can't identify um, a, a, an unknown sequence um, unless I have a reference sequence and that's normally derived by traditional methods and um, it's really important. And as environmental DNA has kind of taken off in the last 10 years, a lot of the work that we're still trying to pull together is reliant on taxonomists um, supplying correct identifications of specimens and us then sequencing them so we can then identify them from eDNA. And that's really important that we kind of cross this kind of gap and have this kind of communication between the old and the new. But yeah, need them both. Yeah. Sahid, anything you'd like to add? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, uh, like um, uh, the, the fellow panelists have said, they, it is very, very difficult to actually estimate what the species and what are the differences and what are available and what is the total estimate because um, some articles mentioned that uh, maybe we have about 8.7 million species um, of life living on Earth as of 2011. And as of 2020, we, we are saying that we have 15 million. But from my own research experience, I can tell you, I explore a particular species from different ecosystems of like 200 samples. And at the end of the day, I found out that uh, all these species are the same thing. Now, how do we classify that where we, are, we want to estimate what are the total species on Earth? Which means that there, there are a lot of duplications in existence. There are a lot of misidentification in existence. There are a lot of overlap these very species. And of course, the basic and the most effective proving uh, method so far as, 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 as of now is the DNA technology as it has been established. So it is, we can confirm that uh, this is the total species we have for plants. This is the total species we have for animals. And this is the one that are available. And this is the one that are not available. Thank you. Great, thank you, Sahid. So, and again, to everyone thinking about how uh, you know the technology in our pocket has developed. How have mobile phones? I'm not sure you can see that. There we go with my uh, background. Uh, how has mobile phone technology enabled uh, you know non-scientists to get involved? You mentioned citizen science earlier on. So, how can non-scientists, students, teachers, people that are interested, start to get involved in thinking about science and biodiversity using you know the technology in our pockets? I can start that one too, because I mentioned iNaturalists, which is my favorite for that. So there's a global, there's something called GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Infrastructure. <laughs> I forget what the F stands for, but it's a, it's a great place to look at what museum records are out there. But also if you use iNaturalists, which is a free program that you can download on your phone, you can take a picture of an organism. You don't have to know the name of it. You know, it'll it'll give you a, a, a potential ID and then other experts will check it. And that will go to that global biodiversity infrastructure. So you can, as a citizen, as a non-trained scientist, you can, you know, add and contribute to our knowledge of, of biodiversity. You can also, uh, well, I'll let the other panelists speak about other technologies that are available, but that's my favorite. Rosetta, is there anything you recommend for people connecting with their natural environment, with their technologies around them? Oh, well, I, I also use iNaturalist all the time. I'm uh, frequently out around um, hiking and taking pictures of plants. So yeah, no, I'm, I'm a full advocate of that. Um, with regards to um, eDNA stuff in particular, there are a couple of um, global initiatives coming out. Um, I think uh, uh, I, uh, e Geo Atlas. I can't remember, I'll write it in the chat, um, but lots of different um, local kind of uh, system science projects where people can take eDNA samples and then um, submit them for analysis and to help with the growing kind of uh, biodiversity monitoring um, at local scale. So uh, there's lots of opportunities to be involved in this kind of um, technology nowadays. So yeah, it would be um, really good to, to have people on the ground kind of taking these samples because I think like boots on the ground is what matters. And um, if we're not, we, if we're able, unable to get these samples and unable to get to these places, then we won't, won't know what's happening in these places. And so we need the samples and we need people to be out there kind of doing their bit as well. 
And I'm guessing with the, the current global pandemic situation, and that's hindered scientists' ability to get out and start collecting that data. So if people are able to go out and explore their back gardens, their local parks, their local areas, and share that information with scientists, that's going to be of a great help to researchers that aren't able to, you know, perhaps travel across the world if they're studying different species. Yeah, I think that's something we've, we've really seen as well in the last year, people uh, appreciating the environment they're in and then taking... Uh, you know, getting into kind of what are these plants growing, what are those birds that come to my garden, and that kind of thing, and, and um, taking note of these and, and recording them in various kind of local citizen science projects. And that's that's really, really great that people are starting to kind of look around them and, and appreciate things. And yeah, mobile phone is, is key to documenting some of these things. That's so really good. Great. And we've had some questions coming from the audience. So, Sahid, I'm going to put this one over to you because it's a genetics based one. This has come from Daniel Trenchke, who's one of our amazing student debaters this year. What do you think is most interesting about research in genetics and evolution? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, the, the, the more interesting part of the research in genetics is that uh, it helps a lot to, uh, to, 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 to demarcate the taxonomical boundaries among the species. And also it helps a lot to understand the, uh, what, what we call the ecosystem uh, demarcation for the species. And also it's, it's, it's also very interesting to, to dictate what are the controversies that have been, uh, that have been happening at the local or conventional uh, technology that is uh, hidden. To be, to be understood by man over years. And the, the TNA technology has been helping so fantastically to correct most of this very uh, misinformation and also uh, effort to, to re-identify and to harmonize data uh, along the understanding of uh, okay, the species, the, okay, uh, the plants, the animals, the population, the uh, endangered, the threatened, and also uh, uh, the conservation uh, strategies and status. Yeah. Thank you. How about you, Prasanta? What for you is the most interesting thing about genetic and evolutionary research? For me, it comes down to like the biggest philosophical philosophical questions that we have: like, who am I? Where are we from? And we're from other species. And if you look at the tree of life that Said's building, that Rosetta's helping us build, you know we can look at where we fit on the tree of life, you know, and the more species we know about, the more we can say, oh, okay, we're on the vertebrate part of the tree of life, the mammal part of the tree of life. And, you know, the vertebrates came from this group of invertebrates and, and where, you know, why are, our, why do our hands have five fingers, you know, instead of 10, like the first animals that came onto land. So, um, for me, the most interesting part is building that tree of life, because that really is a map of, of our origins and our history. Great, thank you. How about you, Rosetta? I guess I'm kind of interested in adaption and how things are changing and how, uh, as the environment changes, how does species persist and how they kind of adapt. That's my kind of interest, uh, particularly uh, with uh, drought and how do species in rivers are they able to adapt and have uh, drought resistant egg forms and things like that how 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 does that work and and how 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 are, how are species successful in adapting to climate change i think is um, my kind of interest Great, thank you. Uh, another question that's come through, this has come from Eva, who's our wonderful technical specialist. You've got her mind whirring this morning. Uh, do you think that humankind appreciates and understands enough about the invisible species we can't see? Um, and do you think that indigenous heritage uh, are more aware perhaps than Western science about their biodiversity? Who wants to go with that one? Some great questions coming through, guys. <laughs> I'll take the invisible species as... Um... Uh, work I've been doing recently on, on kind of bacteria and things like um, the species that less uh, charismatic megafauna, so to speak. So um, kind of the, the, the bacteria and the fungi that, that we, we can now uh, look at and, and, and see the, the change in, in, in the communities within in river systems in particular. Uh, we previously haven't uh, used that information to, to study what's happening in our, in our rivers, like what, again, what, what human pressures are, are kind of having having an impact on on the river so uh, 
I don't think at the moment we we fully appreciate that and 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 now new tools are opening up how we can possibly uh now try to understand and try to try to look at kind of the effects on these kind of invisible species that we haven't haven't looked at before because we've maybe concentrated on the insects or the plants or the fish or things like that so yeah I think new tools are, are really um opening up possible avenues of, of studying these new invisible species but yeah previously maybe not so much yeah so the trust for sustainable living runs a visitor center which is a rainforest uh, an indoor rainforest in the uk and one of the things that we try and teach the students about is mycorrhizal fungi and their importance within forest ecosystems so they're almost an underground or in the forest actually they can be above ground as well in the canopy layers uh, layer of fungi that connects everything all of the plants all of the trees everything is connected by this amazing web of fungi that pass nutrients and send chemical messages and scientists are just beginning to understand now the importance of that but they really think that that's the kind of keystone foundation of having a healthy forest ecosystem is this tiny tiny little mycorrhizal fungi that form these enormous networks that cover the whole forest so it's yeah I think invisible species are undervalued Prasanta or uh, Sahid have you got any thoughts about that? Or do you want to think about indigenous people and whether their knowledge is uh, perhaps or more aware of Western than Western science? I'm not sure if Saeed may be frozen there, but uh, I'll I'll, oh. I'll jump in here. So, yeah, absolutely, indigenous people um, know the local habitat and local fauna better. There's something I call the the dinner data principle. You know, if I the the animals that I'm looking for that people collect for dinner you know will they will know those organisms you know a thousand times better than me trying to collect the data you know they just you have to work with local people um, to be, have a better understanding of the environment and we're lo losing not just species but indigenous cultures um you know all together so um you know part of uh, doing science is, is also connecting with the local people and, and it's becoming harder and harder to do uh, that because of that disconnect. So we need to do a better job there. Okay, thank you. And Daniel's asked another question. He's a keen scientist. So what careers can we pursue if we're interested in genetics and evolution? What would you, how would you encourage young people to get into the field? Who wants to take that one? Um, I could do that again. I, I do this all the time. So I, you know, I, I train graduate students, but you don't have to be a uh, a classically trained scientist to do science, right? So as, as uh, um, Christy and others were mentioning about, um, uh, you know, doing uh, work now, you know, at your current state and working with local people that may have, you know, uh, the next step uh, in, in what you want to do. So find what you're interested in, find who, do, who does those uh, interesting things as a career and talk to them and, and work with them and see if you like it. And so there's plenty of work for geneticists, evolutionary biologists, maybe not, maybe that's a little bit more of a, a defined group within that, but um, you can, um, there are thousands of jobs um, and you just find the one that interests you because that's more important than, than perhaps uh, how much money is being made in that career. But I'll let, I'll let uh, Rosetta and others discuss. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. You need to find uh, kind of the area that interests you and um, find the people that do it and get in contact. I mean, today is so much easier to reach out to scientists and ask questions uh, via social media or uh, any of these kind of different platforms. So, yeah, find something you're interested in and find who does it and um, reach out to them. And yeah, always go for what, what you enjoy. I mean, I, I am a traditional uh, taxonomist by training so my background is very much in looking down a microscope but then I decided to study a bit of molecular ecology for a PhD and have gone around around the houses to get to the, where I am so yeah just go with what you like and see where it takes you. Great thank you. Sahid can you hear us okay you back with us? Yes I think uh, yeah <laughs> very important is my network but I I think uh, if I can catch up with what has been, uh, what was, uh, I, I, I made them discussing. It is very easy in this uh, very, uh, in, in this very uh, career to my from one, from one, my, my old background was actually agronomy, 
which is more or less like a, a agriculture and I transfer to environmental biology, study genetics again and I transfer to a, a plant molecular biology, study DNA again. So DNA agriculture, DNA environmental biology, DNA uh, botany, DNA molecular biology. So it's, it is somehow easy to migrate when, when uh, you, you are actually clear easy for you to to fit and relevant in all the fields available in science. Yeah. Great. So I think the advice yeah. there, Daniel, is find something you're interested in, see how you can pursue it. And I think uh, for all of us as sort of career scientists, uh, you don't necessarily follow the path you think you're going to follow. The more you research, the more you get interested, the more you discover new ways that you can explore the subjects that you're interested in. So thank you for that advice there, everyone. OK, our next questions come from another student of ours, Anvishika, who's from India and is joining us. Uh, with the help of artificial intelligence, can we reconnect with extinct species that we can then perhaps bring back to our ecosystems? Any thoughts on this one? That's a great question, Amishika. Amishika, I guess I'd say, you know, the artificial intelligence is as good as the algorithms that you give it, and we're still sort of far from having the the right algorithms and to to feed in to say like these are the species that are missing from our current understanding of biodiversity so we still need people to to actually be out there you know and and sampling for eDNA or, or looking for species so before I hand it over to the machines I, I want more people to to be out there in the with boots on the ground I said I would say thanks Prasanta Rosetta have you got any thoughts on that That's a toughie. Um, I, <laughs> I would, yeah, no, it's, um, I don't think we're there. No, I don't think we're quite able to, to, to use artificial intelligence in that way yet. And I think it's a fair way off right now, but. Maybe in the future. Yeah, I, I think. Sorry, Sahid, yeah. go ahead. I think if, um, hello. Yeah, I think if, um, if we can flow with what's, what the AI technology is all about, it is what you know that you can mimic. It is what you can mimic that you can recreate. If those extinct uh, species were, were able to understand how their behavior, how their character, how their morphology, how their taxonomy, or how their lifestyle is, then we can actually use the artificial intelligence to recreate them. For something that we don't know, it is difficult to actually recreate it. Yeah. Yeah, so it's all about having that great knowledge base first. Okay, next question from James, who's joining us from Canada. Are there any international organizations that coordinate youth involvement in monitoring species at risk and new species? Anyone want to have a go at that one? Prasanta, you're thinking about it, no? Uh <laughs> well, I, I hate to jump in first every time. So, <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, um, I mentioned GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Infrastructure, whatever, <laughs> whatever the F stands for, um, maybe foundation. And, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of Nat Geo and Nat Geo also helps coordinate um, um, groups of folks in different countries. And so, um, but, you know, going to your local museum or zoo, um, is a great first step as well, because um, they're often, you know, running bio blitzes. And a bio blitz is where a group of people go into an area and, and look for all the plants and animals and whatever else they can find, um, fungi or, or what have you. And so that's a look for those bio blitzes. There's often something nearby uh, that can coordinate and help with our, our global understanding of biodiversity. Yeah, great. Uh, we had an amazing speaker with us yesterday from the uh, IUCN Youth Network. So the in International Union for the Conservation of Nature have a youth program, which is uh, global and international, but obviously they have local pockets that you can get involved with. Um, and on Saturday, we have uh, Christian Schwarzer, who's one of the chairs of the Global Youth Biodiversity Network, um, which is another youth organization. They're linked with the Convention on Biological Diversity. Um, so they also work with youth around the world. They have a global network program, but also have local pockets that you can get involved with within your region or your country. So that's a great way they can get involved. Okay. Um, and, oh, yep. Yeah, let's have a quick look. One more question coming through. 
So oh, Prasanta sharing a link for us for GBIF. Thank you for that. <laughs> Uh, so I have another question for perhaps all of you. We've obviously spoken about measuring biodiversity and understanding why that's important, but how does measuring biodiversity then relate into protecting it? You know, what sort of steps happen after you've identified your new species, identified that they're at risk and need protecting? What happens next to get that protection and stop that species going extinct? I think it very much depends on the species. Um, and where the species is and what the problem is. So um, I think when uh, species and you other guys might know more about this because I don't actively <laughs> um, in charge of the, what happens next, but um, when species are, are threatened, normally what happens is we need to find out what the threat is and identify it and try to, to stop it. So it depends what that is. Um, we, I've worked on areas which have um, had rare species where we've had sudden pollution instances and Therefore, we've had to clean up and uh, and, and try and, and protect that that doesn't happen and stop that happening again. So um, things like that. But obviously, um, uh, more charismatic species. Uh, there are breeding programs that normally happen in, in zoos and things like that. And um, it's all about yeah finding that uh, finding the threat and finding the best solution to to stop it. So all depends on your species, I think. <laughs> I'd, I'd add, um, there's a quote that I used to see when I'd, I used to work at the Bronx Zoo as a kid and uh, in the, near the entrance, there was a quote that said, in the end, we will conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand and we will understand only what we are taught. And so, you know, it's, it's really important to find out what's out there, right? And so we need uh, the people to, uh, we need people to find out what's out there before we can figure out what we need to conserve. And, and uh, Rosetta is perfectly right. You know, we do need to have special plans for the different kinds of species. Um, protecting a, a forest is not the same as, as protecting a, a watershed. And so um, each of those need a particular plan and, and we need to tell governments to help us figure out those plans and, and to bring awareness to, to what species are, are threatened. Thank you. So, Heath, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, yeah, I think um, protect, uh, the next level of uh, protection is actually um, the level that is most important to uh, sustaining this very biodiversity, sustaining the, the nature, sustaining the planet. And of course, after the measurement, then it's going to refill, it's going to give us information, it's going to tell us the direction, it's going to give us a compass of what to do next. Of course, the, the protection can be a kind of a try to maybe enforce a law or, or policy against certain species that are going into extinction or to, to rescue certain species that are not are quite doing well, that are almost maybe gone extinction or threatened and also Oh no, unfortunately, so we're having some connection problems with you. We switched off your video. Ever are we able to switch off video? And can bring up information that are concerned that have been identified to have a particular status. So it is it is a critical towards sustaining the biodiversity itself. Great, thank you. So there are obviously next steps to be taken with the data that you're collecting, thinking about how then that goes into policy making and how that gets turned into law. Um, and it's actually that's something we're going to be discussing at our panel discussion on Friday. We've got a couple of um, ambassadors with us from the Seychelles and from Costa Rica talking about the policy making side of things. So uh, hopefully we can find out a little bit more about that then on, on sorry, on Saturday. Uh, so thank you very much, Prasanta, Sahid and Rosetta for joining us. And thank you for our audience as well. Some amazing questions coming through. I can see everyone's really had to have their thinking caps on this morning with those challenging questions coming through from the teachers and students joining us. So thank you, everyone, for sharing your experiences and your research and helping us to better understand how we can measure biodiversity and perhaps what the importance of that is to us. Uh, and also thinking about how as citizens and non-scientists, we can become scientists and get involved 
either with the technology in our pockets by joining local youth organisations or museums, um, and then thinking about potential careers in science, how we can further pursue those. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. It's been lovely to have you. Thank you for sharing your insights. Um, and viewers, we welcome you to join us. We've got our final workshop for today in about 30 minutes time, which is going to be uh, thinking about developing persuasive arguments through poetry with Alicia Valle Pule, who's a conservationist and creative writer from St. Lucia, who's going to be sharing her experiences. So hopefully we've thought of some inspiring words during our last two talks that we now want to get down a creative message that we can send to these governments and these policy makers on why we need to protect biodiversity. So thank you very much for Santa, Saheed and Rosetta for joining us today. Brilliant. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah.